Hey and welcome to day number 18. This is the first video after two busy weeks and I'm very proud to announce that I'm almost done with the chassis of the Saura RK7. In this video I talk about the front wheel suspension, about the steering unit and the lifting system. So quite a few topics to cover. Now let's jump over to Fusion and take a look. Now, this is the current status. As you can see, the model becomes quite complex now as I was already mounting everything to the base frame. So we have some boogie wheels here. We have a shaft that connects the rear suspension with the front wheel suspension. Um, I have created a steering unit. We have um, differential gear and the carton shaft. We have some tracks on both sides. We have a front drive sprocket. We have some return rollers. We have an idler wheel at the back that keeps everything in place. And like I've already mentioned in a previous video, the difficult part here is actually not modeling the components. The difficult part is to figure out how to model these components in a way that they can be assembled and linked together later on. And this is what I'm gonna show you in this video. I will go uh, through the components in the browser tree step by step and show you how I have assembled and mounted everything to the base frame to complete the chassis like I have it here. At the same time I would like to mention that I am very very happy with how stable Fusion 360 is even on complex designs like this consisting of many different components. So when I scroll down the browser tree you can see that I have quite a few components in the design most of them are linked to external parts. Some of them are created in the current design, but all in all, it's a very smooth and a very pleasant experience. The only thing that happens sometimes is caused by the tracks because they consist of so many different parts and this can cause Fusion to slow down on different calculations. And for this reason, I'm gonna hide the tracks for the rest of this video so that we can focus on the behavior and the function of the uh, component parts that are mounted to the base frame. Now, uh, first, let me explain what this assembly consists of. When I move the scroll of the timeline over to the left, you can see that all I have in this scene are imported components, joints, and quite a few ground commands. So this means that I haven't modeled or haven't built anything in this file and the idea behind this is to keep everything as clean and as well organized as possible. This is especially necessary when you are dealing with models that consist of many many different parts. Under these circumstances it wouldn't be a good idea to draw and build and to assemble the parts in one and the same file. Now when I go back to the very end of the history you can see two groups here and both contain the commands that are necessary to steer the front wheel and to lift the rear axle together with the front wheel suspension. So if I move the history marker in between these two groups, I can now zoom in a little bit and uh, steer the wheels like so. So the slight lag that you probably see here is only caused by the simultaneous recording. It's not there when I only work in Fusion without any other applications running in the background, then it's, it runs really smooth. And uh, let's move this slider to the very end of the history. And this group um, allows me to lift and lower the wheels like so. So again, the slide lag is caused by the fact that I'm recording a video while I perform these movements. And now I would like to hide everything except the, the base frame here and show you how I have imported and linked the single component parts to end up with this result. The first and most important part of this assembly is the base frame. So when I open up the folder structure in the browser tree on the left, you can see that it does not only contains one single body, but it has quite a few different subcomponents and even sub assemblies in it. And a few of these guys have this little pin icon next to the component icon. And this means that these parts are grounded or fixated. And grounding parts is always necessary when you link other parts to them. So the joints only work when 
at least one part is grounded or fixated in the scene. The next one in the list are these rivets, nuts and bolts. And I have kept these um, little details separated from the base structure simply to keep the timeline and the history uh, clean and a little bit easier to handle. Of course, you can also place these details in one and the same design, but the more and the longer the history becomes, the more um, difficult it becomes to keep everything organized. And for this reason, it makes sense to have them in a separate file. Actually, I found a very good method uh, to do this. This will be the topic of a future video. Next, let's show the rear wheels. And when I zoom in a little bit, you can see this revolute joint here that connects the suspension straight to these cylindrical brackets. And this one allows me to move the suspension up and down. Actually, the uh, component itself contains a few additional um, joints that make the movement of these links possible. You can only see this one here as it was actually created in this top level assembly. Then we have the carbon shaft in the center here that is connected straight to the differential gear. And I have used a motion link to spin the wheels when I turn the carbon shaft, like so. And this can be done, or this can be found under assembly motion link. And this function allows you to pick two joints and set them in relation to each other. The next two parts in the list are two components that I call stabilizers. So it's this structure on the inside, on both sides. And these guys actually keep the uh, axle horizontal during the up and down movement. And they also provide uh, some sort of a spring system so that the rear axle is not totally stiff when the vehicle is driving over uneven terrain. And these guys allow the axle or allow the suspension to slightly move up and down um, independently on both sides. Then we have the front drive sprocket that drives the track chains. Actually, we have one sprocket on each side. And these guys are connected with a straight axle or with a straight axis. Uh, as I have it here, that's probably not the case in reality because you mm, must be able to drive or to control both chains um, independently from each other. And on the rear of the vehicle, we have two idler wheels. So the tracks are driven by these front drive sprockets and they are keep in place by these idler wheels at the rear of the vehicle. Of course, you can also turn these guys and they were also responsible uh, for tightening the track chain. Again, you can also turn the front drive sprocket. And then at the top, we have a couple of return rollers, quite a few of these guys, and they help to keep the track in place when it's moving back and forth. At the bottom, there is the boogie suspension unit. I'm talking about these guys here, and you already know them from the video where I was explaining how to use joints in Fusion 360. So you can move these guys up and down, of course, too. Unfortunately, the coil does not move accordingly, and this is because I wasn't able to simulate it in a, a correct way in Fusion 360. Actually, I'm not even sure if this is possible in the first place, but still, the rest of the structure uh, behaves the way it should. And then we have also a front part of this boogie suspension unit. Also, this one can be moved up and down. So they allow the vehicle to run over uneven terrain. And they also add some, some tension to the uh, track or to the chain. And then we have one more on the rear of the vehicle. And this one can be also moved up and down. Actually, this one is connected with the one on the other side uh, through this axis. And uh, when I um, move the boogie suspension, you can see that also this axis slightly moves back and forth. And everything here is connected through a traverse that adds some extra stability to the boogie suspension unit. The next item in the browser tree are the coils for the front and the rear part of the boogie suspension. 
and then and when I scroll down uh, a little bit you can see that I have a couple of uh, components in the browser tree that are not linked to an external file so it's actually the entire Pugi suspension unit on the other side and I have simply uh, used these guys here and mirrored them so that I have them also on the other side. So this is perfectly fine too. You do not have to bring in everything as a separate component. You can also use uh, components that are currently in the scene. Then you can continue with the mirror command and create a copy or a mirrored copy in this case. So that's perfectly fine too, of course. The only thing you have to keep in mind here is that you must recreate uh, the joints again for all of the mirrored components so in my case this means that when I mirror the um, boogie wheels I have to attach them again to the base frame with the joints because the mirror command only creates a mirrored copy of the components but not the joints that you were creating in the top level assembly. The next two items in the list are the tracks, one on each side and I have only created one component here and drag and dropped it into the design twice. So let me hide them again for performance reasons and then let's move on with the steering rack. And this one is probably a little bit hard to see because it sits inside the housing here and we can locate parts easily in the viewport by simply selecting them in the browser tree so that they get highlighted in blue, like so, and this makes it a little bit easier to find the components in case you have many in a design. And let me zoom in here a little bit and also hide the front part of the boogie wheels and the coils so that we can see this area a little bit easier. And now I am able to move the rack back and forth, like so. So this one is directly connected to the steering unit of the front wheels. And do not focus too much on the rotation of the, of the tie rod here because ball joints seem to be a little bit sensitive in Fusion 360 and applying constraints to them um, can make the entire uh, structure to get stuck. So in this case, the tie rod moves or rotates a little bit strange here. But it still works, of course, when I move the, um, the rack back and forth the wheels follow accordingly and this also goes for the wheel on the right. They both move in and out by moving the rack back and forth. Now the steering mechanism seems to be quite um, simple but after some research I can guarantee it's not. You have to consider many different concepts to make steering possible in the first place and I have tried to consider a few of these concepts uh, for this assembly so let me switch to the orthographic view and show you the vehicle from the top. The first principle is the Ackerman steering geometry and this basically means that the wheel that's on the inside of a turn has to be tilted a little bit more than the one on the outside. So if you picture a circle that goes through the outside wheel and the inside wheel then the one on the inside has a slightly smaller diameter than the one on the outside and this makes it necessary to tilt the inside wheel a little bit more than the outside wheel. So this can be achieved by the offset of the ball joint where the tie rod inserts. So you have an imaginary triangle here between the steering axis, the ball joint and the joint where the tie rod is connected to the steering rack. So if I zoom in close, you can see that this angle here is around 30 degrees, whereas the angle on the outside wheel is around 24 degrees. And this is one of the concepts uh, that needs to be considered to make a good steering possible in the first place. Another important principle is that the wheels are usually not mounted parallel to the base frame. So this means that they are pointing inwards or outwards um, just a, a tad and the inwards position is called a toe in and the outwards position is called a toe out. I have decided for a toe in. It's hard to see from the top view because I have angled them for only one or one and a half degree but this usually adds some extra stability when you drive a straight line and it also makes steering uh, a little bit easier. Another important concept can be observed from the front. The wheels do not only point inwards, 
they are also tilted outwards. So when you observe the top part of the wheel, then you can see that they lean outwards quite a bit. This is called a positive camber. And this positive camber also adds some extra stability to the steering unit. Now the last two items in the list are the shafts that uh, move the wheels up and down. So let me enable perspective again and move the history marker to the right so that I can move all four wheels up and down by rotating the shaft like so. And when we take a look at the uh, parts close to the front suspension you can see this element here and this one is responsible for a flexible and independent movement of the uh, front wheel suspension so when I lock the uh, revolute joint of the shaft by right clicking on it select lock then I can move the front suspension slightly up and down like so this is caused by this uh, spring system here and this one allows the uh, vehicle to run over bumps and uneven terrains without having a completely stiff uh, front axle. So let's revert the position again and move up all four wheels like so. All right, then that's it for today's video. I uh, hope I was able to give you some insights about the current stage. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. And I will probably create one or two additional videos about the steering system and uh, on how to model some of the components that I have shown you in this video. So thank you very much for watching. Thanks for tuning in and see you in the next one.